Now, uh, time for us to turn our attention to rugby. Alan Quinlan is uh, with us. Alan, good morning to you. Morning, lads. How are you? Let's start with Munster. It feels like a long time ago now because the weekend was so long and so packed with uh, top quality sport. But Ulster are really good. And so we should start there, really, except that it's the end of the Van Graan era and we get to talk about Ulster again. So, on balance, the Van Graan era was chronically disappointing. Is that fair? Yeah, I think so. I think that's uh, that's the reality. Um, particularly when you, you finish um, the way they finished in the last couple of weeks. I think, um, I said this for a long time, nobody, there's no expectation that they, they should have won trophies this year. But I think um, there's been few highlights. Um, maybe the Wasps game, the Scarlets game pre-Christmas, um, Exeter, Toulouse, the win in Ulster, sporadic um, highs. Uh, but, you know, in fairness, they started the season pretty well. They won their first four league games. And I think um, the first kind of signs that this team could struggle were was probably at home to Connacht um, back in October, I think. Then they went to Ospreys the week after and lost their first league game away to the Ospreys. Um, at the time, I just thought it was significant game they should have won and you know you'll always look back in the league season and if you lose a couple of games that you should have won and they can be crucial and it ended up being crucial for them to be away in the quarter final to Ulster um, they had the opportunity to have a home quarter final home semi final and really maybe challenge and get into the, get into the final which just didn't happen uh, obviously it didn't happen but I think you know, if they went on and lost the final uh, to Leinster, put up a good fight, well, then you'd be saying, yeah, decent season, few kind of ups and downs along the way, but there's a bit of progress. And that's all the Munster fans wanted was progress, I think. And um, the last couple of weeks have just taken their toll. I think the, the Toulouse game, um, maybe it was a false dawn. It was an incredible effort um, by the players that day. Um, but... Look, reality, we can, you've got to, obviously the head coach has got to take take it on the chin. Um, he's managing the structure and the plan week on week. Uh, but the players have let themselves down the last few weeks as well. The crazy thing is that Johan van Graan would still be there for another season if he hadn't taken the money and ran off the bat. That, that, like, does yeah, that, does that, that, is that a big concern for the, the culture and the way Munster's been run that actually nobody within Munster seemed to have an issue with Johan van Graan's reign, that they were happy to keep him on. I think, um, Nathan, and a lot of people mentioned this pre just like around in December when Johan announced he was going and Stephen Larkham, that it could be a problem. And it has been a problem. I think the players have switched off. Um, there's something <clears throat> not right within the, the camp. Um, the standards obviously have dropped in the last few weeks and you know people within the organisation the last thing I want to do is be drawing a load of heat on me again kind of talking about the structure and the deep deep down the the uh, the, the organisation as a whole but obviously in 2016 I, I that's there's some things frustrated me and um, I wasn't very popular for saying it probably within, within that group at the time, but um, I just wanted Munster to do well and do better. And it's like any business, if you're not if you're not performing, you've got to peel back a few layers and see where can you improve. I know there's a desire in there in, within the group, in the organisation and behind the coaches and all that stuff to get better. Um, but it has to be reviewed again and looked at and see, uh, you know, see where they improve. Essentially, well, it's not that, like that's they, six years ago. Yeah, it's not like that's they proved you wrong, ago. is it? It's not, and I was probably the, the villain at the time. Um, and you know, I wasn't. Uh, I was just out of frustration. And you know, I think they made strides under Rassi Erasmus. Um, he be, made the team very resilient, strong, very hard to beat. Um, they lost the URC final, lost the semi final to a very good Saracen side. Probably weren't a the best Saracens teams, one of the best teams that have won a European trophy. So there was real optimism that they could build on that stuff. And um, Johan took over then. And <clears throat> of course, there's some highs over the years, but 
I think the frustrating part was, um, you know, probably lack of consistency and um, the powers that be, Nathan, going back to your question, well, we can, we could have been all fooled into thinking that, yeah, this is the right thing to do. Fool is the wrong word. I don't want to be disrespectful because the Johan is a very nice man, but I think, you know, they've got it wrong. Um, and the decision makers in Munster probably, um, I think at the time felt that um, he was a, a, the man to take him forward. And I didn't have a major problem with it at the time. So in hindsight, we can all say, oh, that was a terrible decision. I think the players and the decision to announce it, him leaving and all that has had a ripple effect that any sort of improvements there, it affected it. And we've seen that in lots of other sport when, when managers an, announced they're leaving. I know myself, I was a player in there. You know, you obviously try and still turn up and be very professional, but there's a little bit of edge gone. There's a little bit of uh, maybe respect gone. Um, and that's why I say the players have to take responsibility. Stephen Larkham um, has to take responsibility around the attack. Um, the mixed messaging that comes out from him on a regular basis, um, contradicting people when we see stuff straight in front of our eyes around the attack, trying to you know say that we played well and we were we did a lot of good things in the match. Um, one thing you you can be rest assured of: the monster fans are no fools. Um, so many of the monster fans that go to Thomond Park or go to all these games are involved in rugby clubs. They've been steeped in rugby all their lives. They're, they're coaches themselves. They're, uh, they play the game. And um, I think it's it's been frustrating. So obviously, if you, uh, if you look back in, at the rain in the last couple of years, um, where, where are we going? But I will say it's not all the... Co I think the, the current group of players should be playing better and the skill set should be better. The attack should be better, um, but ultimately, the players required to win URCs and win U European Cups are not there. That That is a fact, and that is a reality. Um, dare I say, go back to when we won two European Cups, the strength and depth and quality and characters and presence we had of guys who weren't even starting you know, I remember the internationals all being away. There was seven of the monster pack at the time up with Ireland. I was the odd one out, um, playing on Friday nights in Edinburgh, playing on Sundays in, in Dragons. Like the teams we had were, you know, the depth that was there. So look, there's no quick fix solution. I think it needs to be looked at again. Obviously, the structures, the school system, the club system, the type of coach, and they're getting right right down to grassroots level. I agree with all that, and Alan. One thing though, I would say is that it looked like the skills, the the, the basic skills, the handling skills at the weekend, and that's that. Like so, that's not the structural issue that we're talking about. Sure, yeah, better players need to come through the youth system, and they need better investment in signings, and those signings need to work, right? But like the constant knock-ons when players weren't under pressure, that's on the players. Like that, that absolutely. is absolutely, on the players. And, absolutely and it's on the current on the coaching ticket. And it's on the attitude of the players, um, how how they're presenting themselves, and what's going through their heads. Everybody can make a mistake here and there, but it's kind of like a poison jar. That I think the, I don't know what happened to players in the last few weeks, but they whether it was the Toulouse physicality, the psychological effect, or did they believe that, you know, they were they, they were after stepping up a level here and it was just going to happen. Um, there was very little leadership in the last couple of weeks against Leinster and Ulster. Really big concern as well. Because as I said, you know, and I've had this chat, I don't want to keep harping on because... I'll, I'll attract attention from, from the current group, maybe. And I don't want to do that. I, I like a lot of these players. I think a lot of these play, these players have turned up and they've tried their best. But they there has to be some form of looking at the leadership, the decision-making, the body language. Um, and it hasn't been good enough in the last two weeks and, and at times during the season. And I think the frustrating part, and when they look back and analyse their season, they'll see some of the things they did, the highlights, the way they 
you know, they attacked at times in some of those games. Go back to Claremont last year, you know, the fall storms, the win over in Claremont last year, incredible. The way they came back, the type of rugby they played, all that kind of stuff. Um, I could go back season by season and and and, and go through those games. Um, you know, they lost that final last year to Leinster, 16-6 in the RDS at the end of March. A lot of COVID disruptions, but again, a final, not a shot fired. Um, yeah, very against a very good side. So there's been too many of those. So it's it's um, the players have to take responsibility here, and you know there has to be some sort of change. Like if you're going to lose, I'm going to lose like this at the end of each season. Well, you'd be better off playing seven or eight young fellas and seeing how they go. Because well, should Graham Rountree do that? So I know uh, Fekato and Frisch are coming in. Maybe they unlock something in the back line for next season. But if you're saying they're, you know, they're a long way off winning a URC or a Champions Cup, like when Graham Rountree sits down over the next month or so and presents himself as the head coach, should he be saying, you know, this is a three-year project. We've got to get back to basics. We're going to be blooding a lot of young players over the next eighteen months with the aim of, in three years' time, being competitive in semi-finals and finals again? Like, is that, is, is that something Munster supporters would accept? It's a very good observation. I think maybe now they probably would. Um, I think the problem, um, Nathan, and it's a really good question, is that um, year after year, there's pressure on Munster because there's an expectation of who they are and um, the brand and all that kind of stuff which some people outside of Munster will say, well, that's only a load of rubbish. It doesn't matter. Munster haven't won a trophy in 10 years. But look, Munster is still a very, very big brand. We saw what happened in Aviva a few weeks ago, the the, the crowd, the singing, the the energy that they brought to that that Toulouse game and, and the kind of joy. And it brought me back to the great days that we've seen so over the years with the connection with Europe. But um, I think like each year, there's a pressure on a coach to try and win and, I think Johan at times has probably tried to pick more experienced players over younger players at times. Now he has brought through a lot of young players, so um, that 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 has happened. But we probably haven't seen it consistently enough. And maybe it's a case of um, start again, rip it up for Graham Rowntree, and everybody's got to prove themselves again, no matter what what number of caps you have for Ireland or yeah. whatever. And uh, well, we start playing younger players yeah. and and. And, and go down that road because look it'll be interesting it probably is does. a two or three year plan now it probably is a two or three year plan unfortunately whereas this and that's the end of Peter Manny's career day, though you know like I, I, and Conor Murray it's like sad and it's, it's greatest ever players and they win nothing for 10 for years yeah yeah I don't, we, yeah. we should we, sorry obviously and you'll get more of the, the monster conversation on the Red 78 podcast but we should have a word for Ulster for whom this yeah, was a signature they were, win they were brilliant yeah they were brilliant um and do you know what the funny thing is, Jerry? And I mean this respectfully to Ulster. They at times they didn't they didn't have to do anything extraordinary. I like they didn't have to they didn't have to work incredibly hard to get their tries to change the 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 kind of picture of the game. Uh, Munster had moments in that first 20, 30 minutes when they were in Ulster's twenty two and they looked like they were overpowering them. They were going to score tries. They were going to. Uh, control the tempo of the game but too often again as we spoke about the turnovers happen but Ulster kind of changed switch uh, they had a few early mistakes themselves and then they become really accurate um, to score two tries at first phase at that level is would be incredibly pleasing for Ulster incredibly disappointing for Munster James Hume was brilliant uh, I think he's straight in the Ireland uh, team for the first test if, they're, if you're picking the first test this weekend is James Hume starting well, the pro- no, the problem James Hume has is Robbie Henshaw, Gary Ringrose. I think I don't know. There. I don't know. I but, think James Hume. You got to put. You got to put him in the team. Otherwise, there's, there's. Otherwise, you're just picking on. I. Oh, we always pick this, which is what Munster do. But Ireland, surely, James Hume's performance in that game is the best performance from a 13 in a high-level match that we've seen this year. Right? He was superb. Yeah, absolutely superb. Um, he's strong. He's developed his strengths more. He's really physical. Um, lovely stepper as well and he's he's been really really consistent all year for Ulster so yeah there is an argument that he should go straight in there and um, it's very hard Gary Ringfoss wouldn't be too happy or, or Henshaw or, or Bundyaki but you keep yeah, them all honest maybe though you just, maybe, yeah maybe you just roll the dice with him World Cup next year and see if he can throw him in here to deep end 
and uh, say go and play and uh, show some more of that um, a different level different step up um, maybe you wait till the second test and see how it, how it pans out um, I don't know but look he's he was superb the other night uh, Timoney was brilliant as well um, I was disappointed for Alex Kendall, Kendallin because I think um, you know he's obviously been an academy player this year to step up the way he's done um, has been brilliant but Nick Timoney kind of changed gears the other night and was superb so he's kind of put, put himself back in the pit I, and I said this before the game you know a couple of battles on there for yeah. maybe places on the plate to New Zealand Timoney outstanding uh, John Cooney was brilliant as well so yeah, yeah. Um, their accuracy Balakum you know what a player um, coming on a pace to try saving tackle on, on Joey Carberry so um, without overextending themselves they just struck at different moments and um, okay. didn't have to batter away at that Munster line and were brilliant We'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll get to preview the, the um, semi-finals we'll talk about Leinster and, and what their win means for their relative strength or otherwise of the league because it was a bit of a humiliation for the league it felt like when one of your quarterfinals ends up in that score but we're, we're out of time unfortunately we got a little bit sidetracked obviously by the, the end of the Van Graan era Alan good stuff thanks a million Cheers thanks Ed. Cheers Manny You'll hear more of that on the Red 78 podcast this week with Alan and Neve Briggs